Hello and welcome to the Thursday, August 15th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier today is writing about an interesting MSI package. MSI are installer packages, so no big surprise that malware is taking advantage of it. They're OLE formatted, so not like the newer MSI X uh, packages, which uh, you may have run into as well. Virus total uh, detection was actually very low on this one as well, only one out of 32 when Xavier investigated it. Since then, detection has improved. Sometimes writing about a sample makes antivirus tools add them uh, to their repertoire. It's now at 21 engines out of 65. The installer part actually failed on Xavier's system. And the reason behind this is likely that it was targeting Chinese language uh, systems. And that may have been a problem here. It then downloads additional malware that is appended to images. A uh, couple of interesting things here again. First of all, the first image is really just sort of a, well, um, abstract art piece. And the second image is actually a picture of a dictator, Putin. And then the malware is attached to it. In the end, the victim will end up with a Redline Stealer. Redline Stealer is very common info stealer malware. It's available kind of as a software as a service or a product for a hundred dollars or such. So that's why you often see that being deployed by attacks like this. And I have to go back to yesterday's patch Tuesday and there was one particular vulnerability that I kind of missed and that's a remote code execution vulnerability in the Windows TCP IP stack. These type of vulnerabilities are of course always interesting because essentially they can be triggered by an IP packet directed at the host. Now, in this case, it has to be an IPv6 packet. And actually, Microsoft, as part of the mitigations for this vulnerability, suggests to disable IPv6. Now, we don't know a lot about this vulnerability. Some tweets suggest that it may be related to the processing of IPv6 options. That makes kind of sense because that's where these vulnerabilities often happen. And then Microsoft states it's an integer honor flow. The way this usually works is where you have a counter that's, for example, 16 bits. So theoretically, you could go up to a 65,535. If you then keep adding, well, you start again at zero. Could also be sort of a signed unsigned issue, even though Microsoft usually labels that uh, differently. Either way, Microsoft actually labeled exploitation as likely for this. And yes, because it's in the TCP IP stack, you get full system access. So this is certainly something that you need to pay attention to. So let me talk a little bit about disabling IPv6. In its other guidance about IPv6, Microsoft actually warns against outright disabling IPv6 in the operating system because more and more software depends on sort of that dual stack behavior, even if you don't actually use IPv6. But there are a couple of things that you can do to make exploitation less likely in this case. One would be to, first of all, don't hand out globally routable IPv6 addresses. So don't have router advertisements, don't have DHCP v6 servers, and you will end up with uh, link local addresses only. So at least an attacker has to be on the same network segment now, which of course reduces the probability of exploitation. You could also block any IPv6 traffic at your gateway, at your border. This is a little bit more tricky because your host will, if it has an IPv6 address, first try that IPv6 address. So this may again break stuff or at least lead to some sluggish behavior because then you have to wait for timeouts and such to happen depending on the software that you're using. If you're blocking IPv6 at your border, then you also must make sure that uh, you're not returning IPv6 addresses as part of DNS resolution. So turn off IPv6 in your recursive resolver. That may work here, 
but in my opinion probably the simplest way to disable ipv6 is just to disable handing out ipv6 addresses and that should uh, probably give you enough time to figure out how to apply the patch and yes, whenever I recommend doing anything against IPv6, people will say I probably shouldn't say that. Well, as a sort of recovering IPv6 addict, uh, I can say I agree, but also don't agree. And then just uh, quickly, a couple other miscellaneous vulnerabilities from this week that, uh, as usual, easily get lost with Patch Tuesday. Ivanti released a patch for its virtual traffic manager. It fixes a vulnerability that would allow an unauthenticated user to gain admin rights. And then we got a number of patches for Adobe. The interesting products here, in my opinion, are Adobe Acrobat and Reader. There are a number of critical vulnerabilities being addressed that do allow arbitrary code execution. And we also have fixes for arbitrary code execution vulnerabilities, or actually one of them in Adobe Commerce, another favorite uh, target. It's an unrestricted upload of files with dangerous type. So an attacker could probably upload a web shell here. Well, and this is it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking, commenting, and for any feedback that I'll receive. So thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.